Thank you. I'd like to welcome everyone, members, officers, and members of the public, this meeting of the Planning Control Committee. Before the meeting, I'd like to invite the committee member and scrutiny officer, Eleanor Hockcraft, to explain the proceedings. Thank you, Eleanor. Good evening, everyone. If a member wishes to speak, they should use the speak button located on the microphone unit. The microphone will light up green and the chair will be alerted of your request to speak. When the chair invites you to speak, your microphone will be made live and will turn red at which point you can speak. When the public participants are invited to speak, their microphones will be made live by the committee officer. When requested to vote, voting will be via the yes, no, abstain buttons on your microphone un unit. Details of how members voted will be shown on the screens around the room and the result will be visible on the YouTube stream. In the event of a tied vote, the chair will have the casting vote. Are there any questions before we start? Okay, I'll hand back over to the chair. Thank you. Apologies for absence. I received apologies for absence from Councillor Alistair Willoughby and Ian Moody having given due notice. Councillors Amy Allen and Michael Muir we're substituting for Councillor Willoughby and Councillor Moody. We've just heard from Councillor Terry Tyler that his car won't start, so he will not probably not be here for proceedings. Any further apologies? Thank you. Minutes, we have two sets of minutes which we'll take separately. I'd like to take, take the votes on minutes separately so that the members present at only one meeting are able to vote for the meeting they were at includes me. Can I have a proposal for the minutes of the meeting on the 1st December 2022, please? Yes, Chair, I'm happy to propose those minutes. Thank you. Proposed by uh, Councillor uh, Tyson, who chaired the meeting. Uh, may I have a seconder, please? Councillor Daniel Allen. Happy second. to second. Thank you. Any comments on the minutes from the 1st of December, for those who are present? No? Eleanor, could we take the vote, please? Thank you, Chair. That motion is carried. Thank you. I propose we take as read and approve the minutes of the meeting held on the 15th of December 2022 as a true record of proceedings. Can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Tyson? Yes, I'm happy to second. Thank you. Any comments on the minutes from the 15th of December? No, can we have a vote, please? Chair, that motion is carried. Thank you. Notification of, a, of the business, there is none. Chair's announcements. Recording, and according with council policy, this meeting is being audio recorded as well as filmed. The audio recordings will be available to view on ModGov and the film recordings via the HDC YouTube channel. Declarations of interest. Members are reminded to make declarations of interest before an item. The detailed reminder about this and speaking rights is set out under Chair's announcements on the agenda. To clarify matters for the registered speakers, members of the public have five minutes for each group of speakers, supporters and objectors. There's a separate five minute time limit allocated to member advocates. A warning will be given at four minutes to alert you that you have one minute left. At five minutes, you'll be advised that the time allowed has ended and the speaker must cease. Section 4.8.23a, for the purpose of clarification, in order to vote an agenda item at this meeting, a member must be present for the entirety of the debate and the consideration of that item. If a member leaves the room at any point of the item, they will not be able to vote. Change of item order. 
I've agreed to take item eight, 21 stroke 03533 stroke FP, land west of Toot Hill House, Kelsall, before item six, which is 22 stroke 01464 stroke OP, land between Croft Lane, Norton Road and Cassio Lane, Letchworth Garden City. Public participation. Can I confirm that the registered speakers are in attendance? Kevin Hinton. Thank you. Claire Newbury. Thank you. Susanna Russell. Thank you. Peter Turness. Thank you. Lynn Bogey. Thank you. Matthew Wood. Thank you. Now we're going to the agenda. So item eight is land west of Tootill House, Kelsall Tops, Thurfield, Hertfordshire. Jermaine Azabir to present, please. Oh, sorry. Um, Croft Lane. Um, the land is county council owned. I'm a county councillor. I have not spoken to council county council officers or any other county councillor on this item so i come with an open mind isn't it thank you councillor muir jermaine thank you chair and good evening all um so this application this is an application for the provision of three residential units in Fairfield. I do have an update for members. Since the publication of the committee report, a letter of objection has been received. This was yesterday from the parish council. This letter has been tabled, circulated to members and available on the council's website. Um, to give a brief response to the parish council, this is not a new application. The same proposal as it was from before is being presented to members again on the basis that the council has adopted a new local plan and officers deem this a material planning consideration in the ongoing determination of the planning application. Also to clarify terminology used by the parish council, um, previously developed land I mean, this is the bit I haven't actually addressed in my report, so I think I need to clarify a little bit. Previously developed land is described in the NPPF as land which is or was occupied by a permanent structure. And this includes a curtilage of that particular land, whereas brownfield land is previously developed land that is no longer being used. So that is the difference between previously developed land and brownfield land. In planning terms, we tend to interchange these technologies. However, I do not believe this technicality is actually quite relevant for the purposes of this uh, meeting today. Um, also, and secondly, as a point of correction, my attention has been drawn to the second sentence in my report at paragraph 4.4.7, which states, and I quote, all planning applications are considered on merit, and this site already has officers and members approval for development, unquote. This statement is incorrect. There is currently no approval for development at the site, and the sentence should read, instead, all planning applications are considered on merit, and this site already has officer recommendation for approval, and members resolve to grant permission. Thank you very much. I'll now move on to my presentation, if I may. So this is, I well, okay. So the application site is to the south of Kelshall Tops, close to the junction with Pedalis Lane to the east. The site is just outside of the conservation area, adjacent to a scheduled monument and also adjacent to the listed Tooth Hill Manor. 
The current use of the site is known to be a GV parking and open agricultural storage. So the development proposal is for the erection of three residential dwellings and the variation of an existing section 106 legal agreement. So on, on the slide now is a location plan showing relationships with other neighboring uses. Next slide, please. So this will be a three-dimensional image of the site as seen from the frontage of the site when complete. Next slide, please. So this is the elevation drawings and layout plan of the largest dwelling, which is the six bedroom dwelling within the scheme. Next slide, please. This is the street scene elevation showing the landscaping um, plan. Next slide, please. This slide shows the proposed elevations of one of the barn style dwellings as proposed. Next slide, please. This is a street view elevation of the proposed access to the site as finished with the landscaping plan and new uh, planting. Next slide, please. A view of the houses today. No. Okay. So proposed elevations and floor plans of the other barn style dwellings as proposed yeah so next one please so this is an aerial view of the proposed landscaping master plan so this shows the level of amenities space around the development so the development can actually breathe within its, its settings um next slide please here is a view of residential development to the east of the site, close to the village boundary. Next slide, please. A view, this is a view from the site entrance, looking towards the village, looking towards the village. Next slide, please. And this is looking to the west of the site, so away from the village, but from the site entrance. Next slide please. This is the existing entrance to the site showing the expanse of the concrete that is currently existing, which is proposed to be removed to be replaced with um, landscaping. Next slide, please. This is showing the actual concrete hard standing within the site itself. Next slide. Could you move on to the next slide, please? And this is a view towards the village from a point close to the entrance of the site. I think that's my last slide. Yeah. So yeah, that is it. Thank you all for listening. Um, Officer's recommendation remains the same and is for members to resolve to grant planning permission subject to securing a transitional section 106 agreement, a deal of variation and the relevant extension of time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jermaine. Do members have any questions about the presentation? I'm just trying to turn to the recommendations uh, because on the site entrance there, whether you turn right or left, you've got the hedgerow there sticking right out into the road. So uh, is there uh, a condition about the visibility display of that uh, hedgerow being cut back so 
you don't have to put your nose of your car out to be hit by an oncoming car. Would you like to answer that? Yeah. There is a condition. Um, yeah, highways requested a condition that will address that matter. Yeah. I know the council member is having difficulties in IT. Um, Any other questions from the members? Our registered <laughs> speakers. Uh, first speaker is Lynn Bogey, who is an objector. Then you have five minutes starting when you are ready. Thank you very much. Members will be aware that I have extensive concerns regarding this application and the manner in which it's been dealt with. However, in the five minutes I have, I'll focus on compliance with the local plan. Back in June last year, the officer's report and your deliberations were on the basis that the so-called tilted balance was engaged and that there was a presumption in favour of residential development because NHDC had no up-to-date plan and could show only a 1.4 year housing supply. The officer concluded then, and I quote, the benefits of the scheme, in my view, are the delivery of three new homes when the council is manifestly unable to demonstrate a five year supply. The planning regulatory framework has now ch completely changed, however. There's no tilted balance, no presumption in favour of development. Today, as the officer has said, this application must be assessed against the new local plan and determined in accordance with that plan unless there are clear material reasons for departing from the plan. Residential development on this site is contrary to the local plan and NHD policies, including court policy CGB1. This site was considered for inclusion in the emerging local plan, but was rejected. It's outside the development limits, immediately adjacent to the settlement boundary of Thurfield and the village conservation area. Its development would extend the village ribbon fashion along a narrow but busy 60 mile an hour deregulated road linking Thurfield with Kelshaw, Sandon and beyond. It's adjacent to my listed thatched, thatched Tudor home and the imposing Victorian's Tuthill House, a near a scheduled monument. And the senior conservation officer has identified harm to these local heritage assets. You're also advised that there is planning harm due to the unsustainable location of the site on two counts. Firstly, there's no public transport serving the village and few amenities. And this development would lead to increased use of cars to access necessary services in Royston. Secondly, the nature of the local roads without pavements or verges is such that there is no safe access from the site to the village centre, including the first school, church and pub. Many of you were also on the committee when determining the outline planning applications a couple of years ago and agreed wholeheartedly with Mr Tiffin that this site was unsuitable for residential development. You need to ask yourself how you could justify a different decision, given that the only relevant change of circumstance is that local and national policies are now much more stringent. If one of the first acts of NHDC after the plan's adoption were to say non-compliance with the local plan doesn't matter, and it doesn't matter, even though the scheme involves multiple planning harms, and even though the committee has considered residential development of this site unacceptable on several recent pre previous occasions when the planning regime was much more generous to developers, no, none of that matters. It would make a mockery of the plan and all the taxpayer money, time and effort which went into producing it. As the inspector himself stated in paragraph 130 of his final report, I note the suggestion that residential development should be allowed adjacent to category A villages where the land is not in the green belt. I see no particular reason why that should be permitted. Defining clearly where house building should and should not take place is among the primary tasks of this plan and one must draw the line somewhere. The office report Officer's report contains nothing that could be considered clear material reasons for departing from the plan, and I've heard nothing this evening. She takes the view that the potential for the hard standing on the site to be removed is a benefit. However, the site is currently consented, does not, does not and cannot have any buildings on it, so it's not previously developed land or a brownfield site. And the hard standing is almost entirely hidden by mature hedges and trees on all sides. If this proposal goes ahead, the built mass of these large modern houses on the top of the ridge will be highly visible from the road and further afield. As you've already heard, most of the ancient hedgerow which currently screens the site from the road is required to be removed pursuant to highway requirements. Removal of hard standing is just not... You've got one minute left. 
thank you. It's just not a clear material reason for departing from the plan. If it were, every landowner with a bit of hard standing in the countryside would be getting permission to build houses instead. The applicants have argued that if this application is not granted, use of the land may revert to the parking of four HGVs. That is, however, illusory, and that is not the current use of the site. This site has not been lawfully used as an HGV depot for almost 30 years, and there is no agricultural storage going on there either. You saw the empty, you, you saw the empty concrete. All applications for a license to revive these uses have been either refused or withdrawn under threat of refusal by the traffic commissioners. The most closely affected residents and the parish council are surely best placed to judge which offers better local amenity. The current position, which restricts this sensitive site to agricultural use within a screen of mature trees and hedgerow or residential development. And we all continue to object most strongly to residential development on this site. Thank you. Your time's up. Thank you very much. Are there any points of clarification for Mrs. Bogie from members? No. We can then move on to uh, Matthew Wood, who is going to speak in support of the application. Matthew, when you're ready, please. Good evening to members. As set out in your officer's committee report, this application was considered by this committee on the 23rd of June 2022, with members resolving to grant planning permission in accordance with the officer's recommendation for approval. As part of the resolution, the variation of an existing legal agreement has unfortunately taken a longer than expected, and in the meantime, a new local plan has recently been adopted. Therefore, this application is before you again to provide its reassessment in the context of the new local plan. Your officers have provided you with an impartial and objective reassessment of the applicant's proposal against previously refused applications the new local plan, and the fact that the council can currently demonstrate an improved five-year housing land supply. However, your officers maintain that this proposal still overcomes these issues and that there are other material considerations that justify the grant of planning permission despite a new local plan. We hope that you will take some comfort in your officers' second recommendation for approval, which has also been the subject of a review by the council's legal team and there are no objections from statutory consultees. This proposal is, is an opportunity to create a new and clean chapter in the site's planning history and which creates clear stewardship of the site going forward. When you reassess the proposal this evening, we would also ask that you consider the following. The site is not in agricultural use and it is not unspoilt land. The site has a long history of use and it is almost entirely concrete hard standing, which has been used for storage and the parking of HGVs. The site currently has an urbanising and industrial character that detracts from the local characteristics of the village and the surrounding countryside. Visually, it has an approximate 20 metre wide concrete access with high, high metal security gates across its frontage and a close boarded barrier along the site's prominent north and eastern boundaries. This is visible in the street scene and is harmful. The proposal, for free, the proposal for free dwellings substantially improves this situation. It will substantially enhance the character of the site and adjoining the village and landscape. It will be far more in keeping with this edge of village location. The concrete hard standing will be removed. The site access will be narrowed by more than 50% and would be replaced by a field gate. Security fencing would be replaced with post and rail fencing. The site's edges will be enhanced with further high quality soft landscaping, in addition to the retention of existing boundary planting. There is ample room for significant soft landscape planting within the application site as demonstrated by the landscape strategy that can be conditioned. The proposal does not rely on the retention of landscaping outside of the site, but it is, it is clear that the intention is to retain it, and this is required by a historic planning permission for the site. The design of the three dwellings now proposed resembles a traditional farm courtyard with a central farmhouse and subservient barn stroke stable buildings. It presents a rural characteristic that, that integrates with its rural setting, which is a substantial improvement to the current situation and previous designs for a greater number of dwellings. The proposal will also result in a significant biodiversity net gain, substantially in excess of 10%. 
through removal of extensive concrete and replacement with a soft landscaped habitat. Your officers have therefore identified that these benefits, among others, are material and outweigh conflict with policy CGB1 of the new local plan and any other harm. The reference has been made to an existing Section 106 agreement on the site. As set out in the report, it is necessary to amend the 106 as part of this proposal, but only where it relates to the use of the application site and that is because the storage use will cease once residential development takes place. The Section 106 requirement to ensure the retention of the existing landscaped areas outside of the application site will remain in force and in perpetuity. We therefore urge you to again support your officer's recommendation and reapprove this planning application. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Are there any points of clarification from the members for Matthew? No. Can I then invite uh, the officer to respond to any issues raised? No, I, well. Sorry, Chair, there is, uh, everything is clear to me. Everything has been addressed in my report, so I don't think I need to address it anymore. Concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Shall we go to debate? Who would like to speak first? Councillor Daniel Allen, I can see that Councillor, oh, you appeared now, Councillor Levitt, you're second. Councillor Daniel Allen, please. As pre-developed land with no complaints from statutory bodies, I can see no reason not to follow the officer's recommendations and approve this site. I would propose that we approve the site. Councillor Levitt. Um, I think Councillor Allen's uh, made a proposal there. I just wonder if anybody wanted to, was going to second it before I speak. Open for more debate before we second it, but I'm, I'm quite happy to, second, to ask to be second first, if you like. Um, okay, in that, in that case, um, previous application was determined because we didn't have a local plan in place. We didn't have a five-year housing supply. And that was the only reason that this site was granted, because we didn't have any choice over it on previous appeals. I'll quote from the report, paragraph 4.4.2. The application site is located outside the settlement boundary of the Thurfield. This is an area protected by the designation of policy CG, CBG1, rural areas beyond the Greenbelt, where there is a presumption against new development, most certainly if for market housing. Paragraph 4.4.4. .4. The current proposal is for provision of three market house on land that is not allocated in the local plan of housing. Uh, from the site location plan, this proposal does not comply with any of the criteria. 4.4.7. Whilst not policy compliant, and there are several references throughout this report that this does not comply with the policy that we have now adopted in the local plan. What's the point of having a local plan? if we don't stick to the policies we've put in it. Uh, therefore, Chair, um, my, my proposal would be uh, to reject this application on those grounds. It's not compliant with the current policy, and not compliant with the local plan. I've got myself in a bit of a pickle here because I, 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 let, I let Councillor Allen speak because Councillor Levitt's button wasn't working. Um, we've got a proposal here already. Can I ask for a second uh, for Councillor Allen's proposal. Is there a second for Councillor Allen's proposal? If there isn't a second, uh, I will move on to Councillor Levitt's proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Then my proposal is that we refuse the application. It is uh, on the grounds that it's not com 
compliant with the current local plan and not compliant, not compliant with company's present policy, uh, particularly uh, that it doesn't comply with uh, CGB2 to um, CGB1. Yes, please do. Um, um, I, I know what you say, but um, I need to set out that we need to identify the harm. Um, just the application sets out, in my view, the report sets out that there is policy conflict as a result of the change in the local plan, but it identifies there's no harm from the policy conflict and identifies planning benefits, which are the windfall site coming forward because the delivery of housing, even though it's not an allocated site, the delivery of housing is still a planning benefit on windfall sites over the plan period. So that's one planning benefit. The other planning benefit is the reuse of a brownfield site. And another planning benefit is the environmental net gain from the removal of the concrete and the introduction of the landscaping. So those three large benefits are considered to be planning gains, um, which outweigh the technical conflict of CGB1. And the report clearly sets that out. So if you wish to move to um, a refusal, please, Councillor Levitt, we need to identify what the harm is in addition to what the policy conflict is, if the council has any chance of trying to defend such a move at appeal. Thank you. Um, I don't you... Need, think I need to defend what the harm is. It's, it's in contravention of policy. The harm is a, 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 an opinion, not a policy. I don't need, I don't think I need to defend it any further. I've, I've I think I put, put put sound reasons. That's very unusual for an officer to argue against a proposal at this stage when it hasn't even been seconded or yeah. we've had debate on it. But I, I think as the chief planning officer has actually stated this and has asked for us to give examples of harm. Is there any um, thoughts from the members? But the site's outside the settlement boundary. It doesn't comply with any policy. That's, that's what the harm is. It doesn't comply with a policy and it doesn't fit in with a village. Uh, do you wish to respond? Um, uh, stage. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I take Councillor Hunter, who's been waiting very patiently? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Yes. Now, this is quite interesting because I agree with um, Councillor Levitt in the sense that I remember our previous planning officer, Mr. Tiffing, spending a great deal of time explaining to us why this was not a brownfield site. Now I'm hearing it being said that it is a brownfield site. Now, I know planning is always in the eye of the beholder. And some people will look at it as a grey area as to what is and what isn't. But he was quite emphatic that this site had not been developed and it didn't meet the criteria of a brownfield site. And I do agree with Councillor Levitt that um, it is outside the settlement boundary. It doesn't comply with our now taken on board policies and I'll quite happily second his refusal. Acting Development and Conservation Manager, Senior Planning Officer, I've got down here. I don't know who, who, which name goes with that title. Um, Councillor Levitt, I would like to um, draw your attention to my report at paragraph 5.1, where the NPPF actually states that a local planning authority may take decisions that depart from an up-to-date development plan, but only if material considerations in a particular case indicates that the plan should not be followed. And Anne has, my, Anne has expressed why we believe that the site doesn't actually, you know, our decision to sort of recommend approval doesn't actually present any harm. It's more a benefit for the local authority, uh, for the lo local area than it is harmful. So, you know, there is there is flexibility to move away from the local plan. Thank you. Anybody else wish to comment? Excuse me. Oh, 
Any other comments? Uh, Councillor Tyson? Well, uh, for what it's worth, this is quite um, quite a difficult um, decision to, to to reach because, as has been pointed out, it does appear that there's definite policy conflict, and um, the you know the local plan is there to do a certain job. At the same time, we're being um, assured that if we depart from what appears to be the constraints of the, the local plan in this case, we're actually giving permission for something which personally I believe would be an improvement to the area and um, being quite familiar with the, the location I can't see a harm being uh, created by the um, construction of those three dwellings as proposed um, at the same time I am very cautious about recommending that we um, approve this because I don't like the idea of um, approving developments outside of village boundaries particularly a category a village and i'm not certain yet if we've got something in the local plan that says that that's acceptable um if, even where we can see um, that there are certain benefits but just as a, a i would not like to set a precedent of um developing outside village boundaries so at the moment i'm i'm open to persuasion from officers or elsewhere um if there's still time <laughs> thank you any other comments from any members who've not spoken already sorry councillor Noah. um i suppose following on in that vein it's probably more refer this to officers who are present but if we do have an agreed and accepted local plan which sets out a set of constraints that you know have been agreed in terms of what developments can be undertaken what should be and what i suppose sit as the sort of the kind of legal basis which we've agreed as a council we would go forward with um in if it did cut i mean i don't know if an opinion can be given on this but if it came to an appeal is the local following the local plan given more or less weighting than the ability to show you know more benefit than harm in the case of the development being put forward because like i must say councillor tyson's probably there about setting a precedent because this would be potentially the first thing we put forward that could contravene the local plan regardless i suppose of the the weighting of those benefits that the development could bring about and i just wonder if there is a, an opinion that could be given in terms of what weighting would be put forward as part of an appeal Thank you, Councillor Nolan. Yes, please. Um, each application has to be assessed on its case by case or site by site basis. Um, and I note members caution over precedent setting. However, I don't believe that would be a strong precedent because ultimately each case has to have its individual merits and each, in each case it's a weighing act, so to speak, of benefits versus harms. And you come to a conclusion, obviously policy advice and guidance is, is a significant part of the process. But you actually also have to identify what the benefits and harms are in reality on the ground as well. Um, so I think in terms of precedent setting, that's not something as a planning officer I'm unduly concerned over. Otherwise, that would have come out in, in the report, obviously, when we discussed it off the stage before that. Um, in terms of going to an appeal, um, sorry, could you just remind me of your specific question about the appeal? Sorry. Yeah, so it's it's really if this was to be rejected yeah. and it was taken to appeal, yeah. the fact that it contravenes a local plan, is that given you know more or less weighting than the actual fact that there is a, a judgment given by officers that the benefit outweighs the harm i'm trying to understand exactly yeah. what role the local plan plays in that part of the process um in my in in my view no is the answer to that because in every application you have to identify benefits and harms and come to a kind of planning conclusion and that's the, that's the sort of point of, of what, what the local plan is trying to guide um i think bearing in mind in the legislation that jermaine has referred to Obviously, planning is a discretionary um, service and there is the ability to come to decisions providing they're concluded and weighted properly. And there's a sort of logical thought process behind a decision to deviate from the local plan in exceptional circumstances. And the Planning Act allows for that to happen. And that doesn't then undermine the plan as a whole entity because you can justify the specifics of a certain application on a case by case basis. Go on then. Just that one final clarification in the term exceptional there. I 
are we convinced that in the report this would count as an exceptional you know, way of deviating from the plan are we convinced like as officers you are convinced that this would match up to that sort of level of scrutiny if it was taken to that that far to appeal that we could justify at that point that my personal view is that we the council would be find it very difficult to defend a refusal at appeal um, because other than identifying policy conflict it's difficult to identify what the harms would be on the ground um, my view and the report of review of um, Jermaine and the reason why the application is recommended for approval the reason I've already said is that the benefits outweigh the harms in, the, in this instance and that's why the application is recommended for approval Councillor, is this a new point? Or does it follow on from what Councillor Owen's been talking about? Following on. And what it follows on from is that the, 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 my, our attention was drawn to five, paragraph 5.1 uh, NPPF paragraph 12. And it does say in there, where a planning application conflicts with an up-to-date development plan, including any other plans to set up, permission should not usually be granted. Local plan planning authorities may take decisions, not must, may take decisions that depart from up-to-date development plan, but only if material considerations in a particular case indicate that the plan should not be followed. I don't think the case for those material considerations have been made, particularly as you look at 5.2. And the it, it says in there, the site is admittedly outside of a settlement boundary and there remains some harm that would be caused by the development. Thank you. So if we go back to the beginning, Councillor Levitt has proposed. Yes. Second by Councillor Hunter. That this application be Refused. Refused. Sorry, yeah, so, that, so let's make sure our voting is the right way around here. James, which is which is yes and which is no on that? Uh, so just to clarify for members, voting yes to refuse application and voting no to not refuse application, abs abstaining, still abstain. Yes. And, and just for clarification, the reasons for refusal are because it's um, it's in it's in um, doesn't comply with the current um, policies and uh, the local plan, the newly adopted local plan. Chair, that motion is carried. And thank you for speakers. You may leave or you may stay if you wish. Next item is uh, item six, 22 stroke 01464 stroke OP, then between Croft Lane, Norton Road and Cassio Lane, Letchworth Garden City. Uh, Peter Ball to present, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, so short update. Um, since the report was published, there have been a, an additional 17 letters of objection which have been received from neighbouring residents. These reiterate the concerns and objections to the proposal already uh, identified in the officer report. Uh, the Hearts, uh, Hertfordshire uh, County Council Growth and Infrastructure Unit have confirmed changes to the financial contributions required in connection with the development. Um, these changes are, are due to the delay in processing the application and the thresholds being reviewed at the turn of the year. So uh, the primary education contributions are, are, are not now sought. Uh, and then in relation to uh, secondary education, uh, special education needs and disabilities, youth service and waste provision they they remain largely unchanged although uh the uh the projects that that may uh, benefit from those contributions uh, are, are a little wider so the wording changes to uh include the provision of serving the development 
So um, there are some sh uh, short, uh, minor changes to the uh, view of the conditions. Condition two, second line, uh, the use of the word internal, uh, that's now deleted. And condition 20.1, uh, the second uh, sentence where it says this should include a report documenting the consideration of a range of access and uh, approach of options to establish the most suitable designs in this respect is deleted. And in relation to condition 31.1 uh, is deleted. It's dealt with by an informative and condition 32, the reference to M4 bracket three in the second line is deleted. Um, I can turn now to the actual presentation. Thank you. So application here is for outline planning permission for residential development with all matters reserved. Next slide, please. Okay, we're starting with the photographs. I don't have now, so just bear with me one minute. Yeah, so this is Casio Lane access and the uh, internal view from the site. Next slide, please. This is a close up view of the same entrance. Next slide, please. This is a, a view of the entrance from Casio Lane. You see the gates there in the center of the picture. Next slide, please. Here we have the Croft Lane entrance showing some internal trees. Next slide, please. This is Croft Lane looking east. Next slide, please. Croft Lane looking west. Next slide, please. This is the Croft Lane entrance uh, to your left in the middle of the picture. Next slide, please. Uh, internal view of the site again looking towards the access onto Croft Lane. Next slide, please. Uh, some internal views of the site. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide. And uh, next slide. Thank you, Kate. Okay, just turning then to the to the plans. Thank you. You see, this is the location, wider scale. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, larger scale uh, location plan showing the site. Next slide, please. Uh, aerial view of the site in the middle of the picture. You see there, the brown land. Next slide, please. This is showing the site illustrative layout um, with the historic constraints, uh, conservation area and listed buildings. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the same illustrative layout showing the uh, possible open space associated with the development. Next slide, please. Thank you. Any questions of Peter about his presentation from members? No? We're going to the registered speakers. First of all, we have Kevin Hinson, who is speaking on to object. Ready, Good evening. Please? Thank you for allowing me to represent the wider community under the banner of Norton Action Group. Mm -hmm. The planning officer, planning inspectorate and HCC all take the view that the historic conservation area, the only lane within the garden city, the local residence, residence immunity and safety have no consequences from this application, contrary to the facts in wider community. It comes across as HCC and the planning officer have outfoxed all parties and the planning committee in order to gain pecuniary advantage by selling the site for development 
irrespective of the consequences on the area and community. What is concerning is that the supporting data and opinions are based on all matters reserved. With no details and form of the access, despite the access point indicated on the drawing submitted, Without those details, how can respondents judge sight lines and turning circles and safety issues? Add that HCC and the planning officer have previously stated that Croft Lane is the only viable access. Then why is it acceptable to remove those arrangements from the application and thwart thorough and serious judgment of the implications? Thus, community safety can only be guessed at with this application. Is this not a deliberate attempt to deny the planning committee reason to object? With all matters reserved. At the very least, this committee should request details and form of access, as without those claims on traffic safety and pedestrian safety cannot be relied upon this application should be refused on that basis alone. It's a fact that Croft Lane is 3.8 metres wide for a considerable length. Cars cannot pass each other. It's a fact that it has shared surfaces. It's a fact that these facts contravene MPPF and HCC Highways recommendations. But the inspectorate to claim a lorry, typically a bin lorry or delivery lorry, blocking the lane adds to safety as it slows traffic is beyond belief. And surely questions the validity of the submission. Ask the residents, school children, cyclists, and other road users who are forced to navigate in these situations. Traffic has increased since HCC agents assessed it as post-COVID van deliveries have increased, amongst other reasons. As an example, just this week, I've had five separate home deliveries amongst 80 or more dwellings in my vicinity. Other safety issues are illustrated by an ambulance which blocked the lane to other traffic for the best part of an hour whilst treating a patient and a fire engine called to attend the garden fire that threatened Croft Corner, a thatched historic property. But the fire engine could not gain access along Cross Lane due to parked cars and had to reroute via Cascio Lane. Safety issues that the submissions ignore. I'm at a loss to the arrogance of this application with all matters reserved, but guess it's about creating land value so HCC can exploit you have one minute left. a public asset and not about local amenity and safety or what consequences accrue. It is a difficult position for the committee, but if planning procedure is to have any credibility, if not rejected, a request for detailed information on access and form is required. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Hinton. Are there any points of clarification from members? No? Then move on to um, speaker in support of the application, Claire Newgren. Um. Good evening, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, my name is Claire Newbury. I work for Vincent and Gorbing and we're planning advisors to HCC Property. Um, I would like to um, cover points on the following, the local plan allocation, the recent planning history, the current planning application, the scheme benefits and the planning contributions. Um, firstly, as has been identified in the officer's report and has been discussed already today, the local plan has now been formally adopted. And as such, the site is allocated for residential development within that plan. 
In terms of the recent history, a similar planning application was made in 2019, which after much discussion with officers was refused against officer recommendation on grounds of perceived highway safety. An appeal was lodged, and whilst the appeal was dismissed on the technicality, the inspector found that the small increase in traffic movements generated by the proposals would not prejudice highway safety, concurring with the highway authority. The inspector also noted that whilst less than substantial harm has been identified in terms of the impacts on the conservation area, this harm is outweighed by the public benefits of the scheme. Turning to the current application. During the course of the appeal, the current ap outline application was submitted. This is a legitimate route for a planning application under legislation. Um, and this was in order to establish the principle of residential development on the site, which is now supported by the adoption of the local plan. Matters relating to access, appearance, layout, scale and landscaping will all be addressed as part of the reserve matters application, which will need to demonstrate adherence with the relevant planning policies. An illustrative layout plan has been submitted as part of the outline application as an option of how the site could be laid out to deliver fortitude dwellings. This is necessary in order to demonstrate that the amount of development being applied for could be delivered within the site meeting planning policies. The applicant notes the comments from statutory consultees and the planning officer in relation to the detailed policy matters, and these will and can and will be addressed as part of the detailed design development. The current application has been supported by an updated suite of technical assessment work, including an updated transport statement. This notes that existing trips along Croft Lane are 13 trips per hour in the AM pink peak and 11 in the PM peak with low, low existing vehicle speeds. The proposed development um, based on fortitude dwellings will result in two trips, sorry, one trip every two minutes in the AM and PM peak, which is still considered to be extremely low. This was the same as the previous, ass previous assessment and is supported by the Highways Authority. Moving to the scheme benefits, the scheme will deliver market and affordable housing to meet identified need within the district in accordance with their adopted plan. The scheme will deliver 40% affordable housing in line with planning policy, which will be secured through the 106. The scheme will deliver public open space in excess of that required by policy standards. It will also deliver biodiversity net gain in line with policy NE4. It will provide employment during construction and it will generate greater use and investment in local community facilities. It will also deliver off-site improvements to encourage walking and cycling. A number of planning contributions have been requested by Hearts County Council Growth and Infrastructure Team as well as North Hearts District Council. These obligations contribute to a number of services and facilities, additional need for which is considered to be generated as a result of the development coming forward. The contributions are deemed necessary to make the development acceptable in planning terms, measured against the tests that are- You have one minute left. Thank you. The SIL regs and the MPPF. In the case of HCC, the calculations and policy justification is set out within the planning obligations toolkit and the contributions requested by North Hearts are in accordance with policy SP7. To conclude, this application seeks to establish the acceptability of the principle of residential development on this site, which has in any event now been confirmed by the adoption of the local plan. The recent appeal provides reassurance that the principle is acceptable, and whilst access is not for determination, that the previous access proposed and vehicle trips associated with the development would not prejudice highway safety. In assessing the planning balance, the scheme provides a number of benefits, most notably the market and affordable housing, which will contribute to meeting the council's five-year housing land supply. All details of the scheme will be proposed and considered, all 
details of the scheme will be proposed and considered as part of the reserve master's application, which will be consulted on by the council. Just finish your sentence. Okay, thank you. Um, consulted on by the council um, for residents to consider and provide comments on and for members who will be able to determine the, the reserve matters application in the same way as this application. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any points of clarification for members? Councillor Allen, Daniel Allen. Um, can I just confirm that you've said there'll be a 200% increase in trips down Croft Lane at high time, at uh, um, peak times? Can you answer that? Um, yes, but it's based on a very low trip generation in the first instance. So, yes, the, the actual numbers are more important than the overall percentage. Would you remind us what the actual numbers are? Please. Yes, so existing, so we did um, some updated surveys um, last year, and in the AM peak, it was 13 trips for the hour, and in the PM peak, it was 11 trips per hour, and this would um, increase to one trip every two minutes. So the equivalent of 30 trips per hour, two-way trips. That answers your question, Councillor Allen. Councillor, you're you gone. Have you you not decided against it? Councillor Bloxham. Thank you. Uh, I, I might have missed it, but I was just wondering what um, when the survey was done what what day of the week i don't i can't remember whether you mentioned it um whether it was a weekday or uh weekend use because the, the weekend use is is by far and away the um uh, the largest use of that lane i think it was done over several days it is within the transport statement let me try and find it Page 72, Councillor Hunter says. Councillor Hunter, can you do us all a favour and just say it out loud? Oh, cool. <laughs> 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 but it doesn't say the actual... I'm, I'm guessing that's, that's Monday to Friday. Um, <laughs> it's a small point, it's a that is used at weekends. That is big time. Thank you. Thank you. Any other um, points of clarification? No? Thank you. Invite the officers to respond to any issues raised. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, um, obviously the report covers largely this uh, area relating to the uh, access and, and highway impacts. Um, uh, you are not considering, obviously, the means of access for this development that would be subject to a further application reserve matters, assuming that you uh, resolve to approve this application. Um, and and the inspector's report at paragraph 15 and 16 if you're it's appendix one to the report sets out the kind of issues surrounding the traffic flows and the traffic generation forms of view if you want a succinct kind of summary of that that's that's the position um that that we would uh uh that that's the position of or certainly the inspector and one that the that the highways authority came to as well thank you Thank you. And we now go on to the debate. Councillor Levitt. Yeah, a um, little question about numbers, actually. All the previous applications have had the number of dwellings. The site's been identified in the local plan for 37. Uh, Pre-app was for 39, and the previous application was for 42 dwellings 
uh, all matters reserved except access. This application doesn't actually give a number on there, which concerns me greatly. Um, I tend to agree with the earlier speaker about um, it's a weird way of doing things when we've already seen an application with, with the only access on it and that's got refused and come back and the inspector didn't object to that. And then we see it come back with that. And it, it, I'm just a little bit wary. And now we've seen it without actually any numbers on there as well. So we're, 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 if, if we went ahead with, as it's uh, said, an outline planning commission application for residential development, all matters reserved as it stands, um, it could be a hundred houses going on there. It could be anything. So if we are inclined to approve this, and I'm actually finding there's, there's, I can't see any reasons to refuse this application, we amend the um, grant to say outline planning permission application for up to 42 dwellings because that's all be, already been established by the inspector. Um, so at least we have a number on there. We're not going to see an application come back for 50, 60, 70, whatever, on the same site. Do you want to respond? Oh, sorry, I thought you asked first. I was just going to say, this um, application is obviously to establish the principle of um, development on the site. Um, there is no quantum, as you, say, as you said, Councillor Levitt. However, when it does come to, if it does come back as a reserve matters, then quantum will be dealt with that reserved matters. I don't believe by you approving this, you can then, it's a free for them to put as many dwellings as they want. This will have to come back to committee for determination on, on the quantum. I understand that. It's just that the previous application uh, was for ap outline application for res residential development of, of up to 42 dwellings, all matters reserved for access as amended, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is pretty much the same application, um, and the, the number came before the uh, all matters reserved, so I'd, I'd, I'd still like to see a number in there. Unfortunately, as you know, the application before you, the application you make the decision on, we can't change the definition of the application because okay. that's what we're only determining what's been sent to us to um, consider. We, we could add a condition, though, for granted subject to a maximum of 42 dwellings on the site. Uh, yeah, just to clarify, obviously, um, paragraph 4.39 of the officer report sets out the issue relating to, to numbers uh, and clarifies this particular issue. So uh, no, no numbers are specified. The reason for this is set out in the supporting statements. And that related to the previous application when the officer concluded that there wasn't uh, adequate housing mix at a level of uh, 42 units. So there needed to be a degree of flexibility uh, when the reserve matters application came forward, which is why there's a kind of a, an, a, a, a the absence of a number on this revised application. That's that's my understanding. Can we leave that uh, line of inquiry for a moment and go on to um, Councillor Hunter? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think the officers just asked answered the question because I do remember about housing mix um, from previous debates. But uh, the thing that I, I just want to ask is, can we have this perfectly clear? All we're looking at here is, can the site be developed or can't the site be developed? And that's the only thing the committee's looking at. They're not looking at anything else about access or housing mix or numbers or anything. We're just looking at that one item, one item only. It's quite unusual, um, but I must admit, it's the first time I've actually seen it uh, in all the years that I've been doing planning. Um, but we have to look at what's in front of us. We can't amend it, we can't add to it. We have to just go along with, do we think this site can be developed or not? It's as simple as that. To respond yeah thanks chair so that is correct uh, all the matters are reserved and of course you'd be aware it's set out in the report that the site is an allocated site in the local plan also for residential development 
Um, Councillor Nolan, you can know. Uh, uh, Councillor Bloxham. Thank you. Um, well, actually, I'd, I'd like to thank um, Councillor Hunter for, for for making sure that that's plain to everybody. We're looking at development, and uh, but I, I would say. We, we've I'd heard two phrases one about the acceptability for development for residential use um and it's quite clear we need housing throughout the the, the United Kingdom um but I think Mr Hinton summed it up when he said it's it, it's the he used the phrase consequences on the community and I think one of safety is one that we're forgetting and I think that is a valid reason that I'd like to push forward for refusal of this is because of the safety of uh, uh, road users uh, and people around that area. And I think that does mean that we can uh, uh, refuse this application because it is unsuitable for, de for development. We've had this so many times. And I know with the highways, uh, department saying yes we, we we've we've counted the number of his vehicles we've looked at that and it and it's it's absolutely fine i question that because i think people in the community people that live around the area me being one of them knows that area and knows that there are times where those sort of numbers are ridiculous so i would like to propose that we refuse this application on though on safety grounds thank you Do we have a seconder for that? For uh, Councillor Bloxham's proposal? On what the senior planning officer has to say, I will second subject to their comment. Yeah, so um, obviously, again, we'll just reiterate that this is an outline application, all matters reserved. So if you're if you're going to move towards uh, a reason of refusal based on access, there certainly in, in context to the uh, dismissed appeal, which addressed this particular issue and was the reason for refusal in the previous application, um, that would be uh, could be considered to be unreasonable behaviour and the basis for costs at an appeal. So that's something to for, for members to bear in mind. This has already been tested at appeal. So. You need to be clear on on what exactly you're going to refuse it on. Uh, and also, there's no objection from Hearts County Council Highways Unit as well. So as a technical uh, uh, consultee on this particular matter, we wouldn't have their support. Yes, so we're back to Councillor Allen. Then I can't second that because there isn't a legal reason. I will only second it if there is a legal reason. And this is a problem that I've got. Hearts County Council have got us over a barrel and they are setting a dangerous precedent with this where they're going to say that they can go and say, or any developer, that this area of land is going to be developed. No matter what, you can't do a thing about it. And that's the problem. I can't see a way we can do a thing about this. I walk past there on a daily basis, taking my daughter to school. I walk along Cascio Lane. Those figures are incorrect and it is dangerous. But legally, I can't prove that. So it's not fair. Um, this has been put forward in the local plan. So really the land should be sold saying this is already a part of the local plan. This is literally Hearts County Council tying all loose ends to put us with no chance of protecting our residents that are being put in danger. But I can't see a legal way to stop this. Please, somebody help me out. Councillor Tyson. Well, my assumption would be that the moment to do that would be at the reserved matters stage when it comes back to the committee, in, in which case it would be perfectly acceptable to refuse on certain grounds that we can't refuse it on at this point point in time. So we are at the point where Councillor Bloxham has proposed. Do we have a seconder?
No button. Did you used to speak, Councillor Levitt? Because there's no button, Sharon. Okay, I'm going to try and move it on a little bit then in that case. I take the point about the numbers we can come back to on the reserve matters. Everything else we can come back to on the reserve matters. The highway safety we can come back on the reserve matters. I don't like this. I don't like the application one little bit. I do think it's a device to increase land value and nothing more than that. Um, and I don't like the committee being used in this way to do to, to do that. However, we don't have any technical grounds or legal grounds to refuse the application. If we did and it went to appeal, which is already being tested, we'd probably lose the appeal. In that case, we'd lose all control over what happens on this site. And I don't want to see that happen. I want to see this committee have the control when this comes back. Therefore, I'm going to move that we accept the recommendation and grant approval so we can see it come back under reserve, uh, see all matters, the issues of reserve matters come back and we keep control of it. And that's the only reason I'm doing that. So we keep control of it. Uh, Councillor Muir, are you going to second it? Yes, I will second it. And I agree with everything that has been said by my fellow councillor here. Um, this is a case on all matters at the next application uh, to debate on everything. Thank you. Should we go to the vote? Go to the vote, please, Anna. Thank you, Chair. That motion is carried. Item seven is 22 stroke 01810 stroke FP, land adjacent to unit three on the west side of Cadwell Lane, Hitchin, Hertfordshire. Harriet Sanders to present. And she will also be reading Councillor Albert's written submission because Councillor Albert cannot be here today because he's a by election. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and good evening, everyone. Um, I have two items to update to report to committee. Firstly, the proposed amendments to the conditions which have been tabled and circulated already to members. I support these amendments and the agent is also in agreement. Secondly, I have received a formal consultation response from the Environmental Health Officer regarding noise at the site. I will read his comments. Whilst in general, I do not have many concerns regarding noise from the premises, the distance to residential properties, the layout of the site providing some incidental screening, the site being accessed by smaller vehicles and the likelihood that there would be limited activity during the night, etc. I am conscious that there has been no noise assessment submitted in support of the application. This being said, and in light of the objections, it may be prudent to restrict the nighttime activity in some way. This could be achieved either, either via a condition requiring the submission of a noise management plan for approval prior to use or restricting the hours to daytime hours 0700 to 2300 and requiring a noise impact assessment should nighttime use be required. Now to the presentation. Thank you. This application is for the use of the sites for 20 containers for long-term storage. The site is located on the edge of the industrial estate on Cadwell Lane and falls within designated employment land as set out in the adopted local plan. Next slide, please. Uh, this photograph shows a view of the site from Cadwell Lane coming towards the industrial estate. You can see the adjacent unit three in the background and the edge of the recreation ground. Next slide, please. This, site show, this slide shows the site when viewed from the road and part of the access. Next slide, please. And this photograph shows the full access with the site on the left and unit three on the right. Next slide, please. This photograph shows the view out of the site looking towards other empl employment uses opposite including the two-storey building opposite, and you can also see the closest residential premises beyond. 
Next slide, please. Again, this shows the view out of the site towards other industrial uses looking across the front of Unit 3. Next slide, please. This shows Unit 3 looking towards the rear of the site. Next slide, please. And this shows the rear of the site. Here you can see some of the change in levels as the site slopes away from Unit 3 and away from the road towards the far rear corner. Next slide, please. This final photograph shows the site looking across the recreation ground as you approach the industrial estate. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this shows the proposed street scene elevations and the relationship to Unit 3. Next slide, please. This shows the proposed elevations and site layout. The southwest elevation shows the view of the rear of the site. The northeast northeast elevation shows the view of the storage compound and gate from the front of the site. The northwest northwest elevation shows the view when looking from Unit 3 and the southeast elevation when looking from the recreation ground. And you can see the proposed layout below. Next slide, please. This is the site location plan. The line in green denotes the title plan boundary of the recreation ground. Next slide, please. This is existing block plan. Uh, next slide, please. Shows the proposed block plan. Thank you very much. Any questions? And um, I have a question. From the photographs and the maps, there seems little evidence of residential dwelling. Facing the site is um, Highfield Avenue, Girdle Road, Cadwell Lane, etc. Um, further down the road is Grove Road. The back of the site, we have the River His railway line, and then the roads that back on from Old Hell Way. So I think it's important for the members to know that, in fact, there is quite a large residential area where the noise does travel from whatever happens on Cadwell Lane. Thank you. Councillor Hunter. Thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to ask the officer which of the items that were suggested that you read out you were intending to put into the um, conditions, whether it were one or the other, because there was two suggestions there from the officer, whether or not to do X or Y, which one were you suggesting to put into the um, report? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I quite understand the question. Well, you mentioned about noise and an officer had come back to you from the environment, I think it was, and given you a, a report to say to do X or Y. And there were two statements you read out, or two sentences, it could be done this way or that way. I wonder which you were considering to put into the report. Yes, understood. So my the report that I read out was the statement from the environmental health officer. Um, we actually had a verbal conversation along those lines prior to the submission of the committee report. Um, I took the suggestion of placing a restriction on the hours to 0700 to 10 o'clock, which is set out in my um, conditions attached to the report. I've missed it. Okay. <laughs> I think it was, it came by email. Yeah, separate old conditions. It, it, on the conditions three on the report. As well. Um, Councillor Bloxham. Uh, I think I need to uh, seek some legal advice because I've just realised exactly where this is. And I have a client who's live, uh, who works opposite. Would that be, um, I've made no predetermined pre uh, uh, determination of it or anything like that, but I've just realised that Unit 2 is actually a client of mine for work. So I don't know whether that would prejudice anything at all. Um. Sorry. Sorry to uh, throw that at you, but 
So this is unit three. Uh, so yeah, is- opposite unit three is opposite. It is uh, unit two, and that's my client. So they're on the opposite side of the road, not exactly in front of, but they're opposite opposite side of the road. I'm just looking at it now. I, I'm sure I'll be I, all right, I, but I don't think. Well, well, it definitely wouldn't be any of the interests in terms of whether it's a de- uh, declarable interest or uh, other interests. That's fine. So I think you'll be fine. Thank you. Unless your clients, are, I don't know, <laughs> made an objection. So, yeah. Thank you. Councillor Muir. Chair, um, on your recommendations uh, about noise, you're suggesting they can start at 7 a.m. and finish at 10 p.m. I think those hours are far too long. Um, there are houses around uh, just further down the road. I did go and have a look at this uh, uh, later on t- this afternoon, and I think that 10 p.m should be something like about uh, 7 p.m. at night. It's not clar- quite clarification, is it? Because clarification be, is it right or wrong? Do you want to say with the debate, which will be Yes, soon? certainly I will do. And you can be first on the debate. Yes. Councillor Levitt, is it clarity? Yeah, it is clarification. The- I agree with your condition about the operating hours. Um, the lighting one would 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 you you would it, it says to be agreed, but can I take it? It probably would mean that the lighting would also operate, not operate in the closed hours as well. It would seem sensible. Um, that would be a matter of detail that came in for the submission of the discharge of conditions. Any other questions for clarity? Can I then call the motion to speakers? First of all, I've got Susanna Russell, um, who is objecting. Are you ready, please, Susanna? Okay. Um, hello, I'm Susanna Russell, representing Oliver Russell Electrical, objecting to the proposal based on public and local business interest, the appearance and the security measures. Just to highlight, there was a proposal put forward for Unit 1 Cadwell Lane to extend the property to which there were no objections from any neighbours or community, highlighting that receiving 18 objections from businesses and the local community in response to this proposal emphasises there's many people concerned. This proposal has gone from an original 60 to 40 to 20 containers. Our concern would also be that if 20 were granted, a future proposal for additional stacked units would be put forward ignoring any substantial reasons for objections and how would this be guaranteed that it would not happen. Point one on appearance is unfortunately I've printed out some pictures for you but I'm not allowed to show you um, of the location um, as it has been for the last few months and will be for the next couple of months um, as you would be able to see. These photos show that this displays there's very minimal coverage from for security and screening from the existing hedging that provides the location, is provided from the location of the playing field looking down towards the proposed development. This is in the proposal as a means of obscuring the containers from the playing field. As it stands, the containers are in full view as the hedging is currently merely twigs and foliage. And this is a big concern raised by many of the residents that objected as it degrades the appearance and environment of the playing field. Back in 2016, an initiative was granted to improve the overall welcoming appearance of Cadwell Lane playing field. The main principles of this project were to involve Im- improve the welcoming appeal to the area enable visitors to feel safe and enjoy the site. The addition of large monolithic storage containers on the perimeter of a business area next to a playing field is not in line with these principles. It won't improve or provide a welcoming appearance or make visitors feel safe or able to enjoy the site. Security, access can be gained from each side of the location as there is no security fencing around the entire perimeter of the proposal. As the neighboring property, we don't have fencing in place, except for a small amount to the rear of the property. As in the past, this was where an area where youths used to climb up the riverbank, graffiti and do drugs. No perimeter fencing invites antisocial behavior and loitering. 
affecting local businesses, the community and the public playing field, which is right next door. This is low level security for containers because opportunists can cut into the size of these containers from any angle. The containers could be climbed, graffitied, increasing the risk to safety and a steep slope and river, be uh, river beneath them at the back, again in affecting security and vulnerability of users of our premises and the neighbouring children's playing field. Several of us also loan work in the office. The um, overshadowing presence of these shipping containers will create dark, enclosed areas, causing concern for vulnerability and security business surroundings. The entire location is not going to be supervised at any time by the landlord, threatening security levels. Equally, how are stored items going to be governed for, governed for the containers? Items are stored in the containers could be potentially hazardous, if not regulated, causing danger to members of the public in the playing field, public footbath behind and our adjacent business. I question how an imposed restriction and regulation of goods stored by public within the containers would be overseen to ensure the safety to all, just to highlight the recent fire on 25th of October 22 at the recycling depot on Cadwell Lane, suspected to be caused by stored batteries. Congestion. We have shared access and egress from the um, entrance of the property. You have one minute left. Cadwell Lane is already frequented by HDV vehicles and trucks daily to the scrapyards with regular traffic jams and queues covering the access to our property. Um, the entrance to the storage containers is opposite these already congested roads. Equally, by removing the existing car parking provision for eight cars at the front that's paid for by Hitchin Motor Care to the landlord would increase traffic congestion to Cadwell Lane and Wallace Way, as these cars will have nowhere else to park except for the road and have used this facility for 33 years. This parking provision, we have been informed, was originally established to for the use of businesses in Cadwell Lane and Wallace Way. Removing the existing car parking facility would be potential loss of a valued local service. The land adjacent has always been um, designed as low-level, non-obtrusive parking that serves the local businesses and a buffer zone to the paying field. We do also have concerns over noise the unlimited access, the noise, the light, the banging of steel containers, hindering everybody, waste, river, road, debris, vermin and contamination will increase. The 24 hour surveillance and lightning lighting will affect the wildlife behavior in the area, distracting neighboring, neighboring residents and businesses as outlined by multiple residents in their objections. Equally, I do question why this proposal now only states one property Sorry. is affected um, by this development. Please? Yeah. However, the previous proposal states three. Why has this changed? This most definitely affects more than just us as a neighbouring property, but the surrounding community. Thank you. Any questions from the members on clarity? No. Can I then call on a Pete Turness, who is a supporter? Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Pete Turness. Uh, I've lived in Hitchin and worked in Wallace Way for 50 years. In conjunction with several family members, I run small, four small businesses uh, from Wallace Way, Housewater, GNL Coatings, IPC Print Limited, and Aston Properties. And in total, I employ between 15 and 20 people. I purchased my first factory in Wallace Way in 1988 and have since purchased eight other units in Wallace Way, some in conjunction with my children. In 2006, I purchased the Cadwell Lane car park as part of a package, including 11 Wallace Way and a redundant car park at the top of Wallace Way, which has since been absorbed into recycling lives to create better traffic flow. In addition to my property activities, I liaise with recycling lives which is Hitchin's largest industrial site, uh, to endeavour to establish points of activity or disruption that might affect my own business activities or those of my industrial neighbours in Wallace Way, Cabell Lane and Bilton Road. And from time to time, I email a list of 30 businesses with updates and relevant, relevant information. What I'm trying to explain is that I have the interests of this small industrial area at heart. The Cabell Lane uh, site in question has always been greatly underutilized and has always suffered from underfunding by most users, although I would hasten to add uh, that Hitchin Motorcare stand alone in their willingness to contribute to the maintenance. 
Uh, Hitchin Motor Care are now the only occupiers of the 24 place site and occupy, occupy three spaces under an historic lease. They previously leased four further spaces, but this lease expired in 2007. I've, offer, I've offered them alternative and more convenient parking to facilitate their three spaces together with their expired spaces, but for reasons based on incorrect assumptions by Hitchin Motor Care, we have been unable to conclude negotiations. These parking spaces are adjacent to and opposite their premises uh, and would no longer require their staff or customers to cross the busy Cadwell Lane, although they would still have to cross Wallace Way. Container storage is a relatively new innovation. Uh, on container sites countrywide, it is generally accepted that within the sector that customer parking only occurs adjacent to a customer's container. By, by definition, providing working from a rented container is prohibited, which is our plan. Remote parking is an impractical concept. Throughout my factories in Wallace Way, I have nine fully occupied shipping containers and require even more for my own use. In effect, we will even be our own customer. We are strictly targeting long-term tenants and intend to impose strict terms and conditions. Trading on site will not be an option and monitoring and security will be significant. Regarding comments made on the planning website, false and inaccurate information was included within some of the submissions. Some of the inaccuracies have been amended and some of the false information has not. Finally, five or more of the comments made uh, on the uh, council on the planning website relate to a party that has made two financial offers to me for the parcel of land and I believe their comments could be influenced by this factor. In summary, some points uh, of disagreement focus on parking. Unlike other nearby industrial roads, highways have chosen not to restrict parking in Cabell Lane and Wallace Way, which I believe has created traffic, traffic flow problems and congestion. Uh, I have little more to add other than it is really a, a natural progression for this site. Um, and that's where we stand. Thank you. Do you have any points of clarification for, mem for members? Uh, Councillor Levitt. Thank you. Um, you good evening. You said... Um, that they're probably single use containers with single user per container. Um, do you intend to keep the containers with a single point of entry, i.e. one set of doors at one end and not, not do what they do on some other sites and sort of cut mm -hmm. holes in the side and add extra bits no, and make no, them we, we are avoiding joining containers, which I know has happened on a uh, site in Hartford, which I, I know quite well. And there's no plan to introduce a, a side door or a door at the back of the unit. Uh, and indeed, we are planning to put a, a palisade fence around the site, uh, and that will be positioned fairly close to the back of the units. Councillor Allen? Um, may I ask if you're expecting vehicles over three and a half tonnes to use the site for access to the um, containers, please? Uh, we don't anticipate uh, vehicles uh, any larger than that. Uh, we are hoping to um, attract uh, a more private level of container user, um, furniture uh, and goods and chattels. We uh, will be storing some bottles in them, uh, but they will be delivered on our forklift because we have units 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 and 12 on the other side of the road uh, where we have our main business. Um, we don't anticipate any need for heavy goods vehicle uh, to enter the site, perhaps vans uh, with furniture and things, but generally we're looking for long-term storage clients, uh, certainly not anybody working from the containers, which I know does happen. Uh, we are, you know, we, we have a lot of presence in the road and we're as keen to ensure that uh, it's not used in an antisocial way, uh, including noise, including light, uh, and pests. Any other points of clarification? Councillor Bloxham, did you have one? Okay. I've got two, two points I'd like to clarify. First of all, 
you said that, that um, the county council had not put any parking restrictions on the road. I think you probably need to add yet. And in the photographs, you noticed big concrete blocks that had been put along the road. Recycling lives to the, they're actually private blocks owned by Recycling Lives per the scrapyard that are positioned at the top of uh, Wallace Way. And after discussions with them as to how we could stop vehicles parking on the grass verge, uh, they actually got a contractor to come in and move the concrete blocks from their yard to that verge. So those are uh, privately owned concrete blocks, I guess illegally dumped on the grass verge, but they have served a purpose. And recently that verge has been repaired uh, and it's starting to look fairly presentable. Um, they've also positioned three other blocks on the corner of Cadwell Lane to Wallace Way, uh, which are quite unsightly, but they've been put there to avoid further damage to a very high curb and some electronics that are in the, in the pavement. Question, second question. Under what circumstances would one of your potential customers wish to use these containers between the hours of 10 p.m. and 7 a.m.? When I started House Water, we had a storage facility over in Stevenage and we installed equipment throughout the country in hotels. And quite often we would embark on a, a trip to the north or the south uh, in the early hours and we may need to go and pick up our, our equipment now that worked for us in those days and we might go to the storage facility in Stevenage at four o'clock I, I now see that as far as this application is concerned uh, we should restrict access and I think 7 a.m bearing in mind there's a dairy one building along that I think starts a good deal earlier and the scrapyard starts at six uh, I think seven is reasonable. Uh, and I think that we could reduce the 10 o'clock to perhaps eight o'clock or even seven o'clock. Uh, I don't feel the sort of client we're looking at is probably not typical of my use of the, the storage we had in Stevenage. We're looking for a, a private uh, renters as opposed to businesses. Uh, businesses will will come along, I'm sure. Uh, but, you know, we're we're trying to, if there is such a thing as a high class container they're being insulated so they have insulation in the ceiling to stop damp uh we're ventilating them and we're lighting them with 12 volt, 12 volt lighting so we're trying to make them relatively you know usable for private individuals uh who won't feel intimidated going into a container yard at, in the dark and accessing their goods and chattels could you just clarify for me the, the hours you were you are now suggesting? Well, I'm I'm happy to accept the recommendation. I don't feel it's going to be um, decisive on our our, our business uh, if we can't open up before seven, and I don't feel it's a problem if we have to close uh, and make sure that the time lock shuts at eight o'clock. Uh, I think initially it was generally thought that we'd be twenty four seven because it's a self administered storage but i can't see any problems that we would encounter with having much greater restrictions it's not a it's not a worry you know so if we had restricted hours i don't feel it needs to be any later than seven in the morning but certainly seven eight o'clock in the evening i'd be more than happy with i don't feel it's going to be instrumental in causing us any customer problem so i'm trying to get my mind around how this works so how will you know that a customer is actually using these facilities between these hours when you've got no staff on site? Be there, there's a, it'll be an access through a, a keypad to the site, and that access will either be denied outside of the hours that we're controlling the site, uh, or the terms and conditions will state that they can't go there after eight. And if they go there after eight, they will be in contravention of the terms that we are trading with. So. Um, you know, I, I mean, in reality, we're looking for people who really don't want to go. We're looking for the, the sports club member that goes once a year and not three times a week. Uh, a friend of mine runs another storage facility and he had a, a client who put his parents' 
possessions in to a container. 16 years later, 16 years later, having paid £120 a month, he returned from Brussels, he emptied the container, and he took out a photo album. And the rest were the rubbish. That's the sort of client we're looking for. I don't think there are very many of them about, but you know, we are not looking for somebody that's going to be storing uh, gas containers to uh, you know, hit the market when the weather turns cold. I will, I'll let somebody else have a question. Councillor Tyson. Are your name no, I, I, I'm done. I was going to ask about the times. Yes. How do you know what is being stored in your containers? Don't store dangerous products. Uh, I'm always a bit concerned that yeah, some of the car garages Chair. the garage did. Sure, if I might just interject, these are points of clarification. We're sort of extending the public speaker's speaking time at, at this moment because this wasn't actually raised within the presentation. Yeah, the, the, yeah, yeah, I do appreciate, but yeah, this isn't a chance to question. One would like to think in the main. Invites the officer to respond to any issues raised. Yeah, um, I feel that the issues raised have been covered in my report. Thank you. It's a debate. Um, who did I say could be first? I can't remember. Michael, uh, Councillor Muir. Oh, thank you, Chair. I've got nothing against container parks or whatever you call them. Um, I do experience a container depot, shall I say, next door, right next door to my airfield boundary where I fly. And whenever those doors are opened and closed, we can hear it across the airfield. Uh, and where this uh, will take place is far closer to houses than where our launch point is on the airfield. So it will be noisy. Um, we've heard from the applicant that he doesn't mind reducing from 10 o'clock. And I think um, the hours should be reduced to six or seven because there are families that will put young children to bed about six or seven. So I'll be happy with any of those times but I do feel the timing has to be limited. Thank you. Your planning officer. Yesterday, you asked me to read out a statement from Councillor Albert. Yes. Um, this is a statement from Councillor Albert. Dear councillors, I would like to apologise that I cannot be personally present this evening. As you may know, I am standing in a county council by-election today and the count starts at 10 p.m. I hope this statement can be read out or copied to members of the planning committee. Originally, I called in this application when it was proposed to include a double layer of containers which would tower over the neighbouring industrial units and the recreation ground. I was also concerned about the safety aspects of this and what would be at what would be an unstaffed site. It is welcome that this has now moved on. The revised application is for fewer units in a single story. For neighbours, this is a considerably better, this is considerably better than what was originally proposed. However, I still have some reservations about the scheme. Summary of key points. There should be a condition to enable quiet enjoyment for neighbours and least impact to wildlife around the recreation and river area that allows opening times only from 0800 to 2100 hours at most. If longer hours are allowed, how will this be enforced? 24 seven opening is unacceptable. The assumption that larger vehicles will not use the site is untested. This should be conditioned. Fewer containers will help with parking issues. Neighbors parking spaces become inaccessible even at single storey, the containers will have a detrimental impact to neighbours. Fear that there will be future application for further storey. 
no formal standard set in lighting condition as to what would be acceptable to avoid detriment. Clear condition needed to protect damage to trees and hedge on immediately adjacent land. If application is approved, welcome that condition of the containers will be reviewed after five years. There needs to be a condition on adequate waste disposable arrangements. Conditions on CCTV and planting are also welcomed. Details. Point one. To allow for quiet enjoyment of neighbours, 24-7 operating hours, even with a noise impact assessment, is unacceptable. How will any noise impact be assessed? There are already issues with lorries waiting for 5 a.m. for the scrap metal yard to open. The addition of floodlights to allow for overnight opening will have a detrimental impact on wildlife in neighbouring riverbank area. My view is that opening hours should be no more than 0800 to 900, 2100, at the very most, ideally a bit less than this. Point two. The officer has recommended that there will be a condition about op operating hours, 0700 to 2200, unless a noise impact assessment is submitted. But how will this be enforced by the applicant each day if no such assessment is submitted? Will electric gates be timed off? It is not clear how this will be achieved. I think the condition as drafted needs to be strengthened. Point three, while there are no formal objections from highways, there is an assumption that larger vehicles will not use the site. How do we know this? How can it be prevented by the applicant? This should be conditioned. Point four, the parking spaces that are provided are below the planning authority's parking standards, 75 meters squared for B8 storage. Highways also say that spaces are a little lacking in turning space. Fewer containers could help to meet those standards and space. The planning officer states that they think this refers to an earlier scheme. If so, then a further comment should have been provided by highways. This is an important admission. Point five, highways also raise, but without solution, that by long-standing custom and practice, the access road also serves as a parking area for the neighbouring unit, and these spaces will be left with an access road and turning space of just 2.8 metres, making these spaces almost impossible to use. This can't be fair or right. Point six. Even at a single storey, the containers will still have a detrimental impact on the light, privacy and security for unit three next door. This needs to be taken into account. There is a fear also that the applicant will seek in future to reinstate a second story plan. Point seven, it is welcome that there is a condition about lighting. However, no standards are set out by the planning officer as to what would be acceptable to ensure the immunity of neighbors is protected and that no unacceptable harm is caused by the local environment and wildlife. Again, this needs to be strengthened. Point eight, the paper sets out that the land within the application red line falls within the ownership of the applicant. There has been some tree removal already, arguably some on N NHDC land. There needs to be a clear condition on the protection of existing trees and hedges on neighbouring land. Point nine. In addition, I agree with the condition. Sorry, point nine. In addition, I agree with the condition that there should be a review after five years by the planning authority, which would also consider the state of the containers at that time and whether additional landscaping was needed. Point two, point ten, sorry. The officer mentions, <clears throat> excuse me, that the applicant has made no mention of waste disposable, disposal. I would dispute that there is room for both car parking and adequate waste disposal arrangements. This needs to be subject to a condition. Point 11, <clears throat> excuse me, point 11. It is welcome that the officer is recommending a condition on CCTV monitoring and also the condition on additional planting at the rear of the property to help biodiversity is positive. It's the end of the statement. Thank you. Thank you for reading that. Of course, we cannot ask questions of Councillor Albert as he is not here. So shall we go on to debate? Councillor Levitt. Uh, thank you, Chair. I've taken the points about the operating hours. Um, I think it would be extremely unfair to put a, a later start time than seven o'clock on there. Um, 
as the applicant said, the, the scrapyard starts at six, the dairy starts at six. Most of the business ups there start at seven o'clock in the morning or slightly earlier. So to, to restrict their hours, I think, would be somewhat unfair uh, to, to put a later start time on them. Um, the applicant's willing to take a uh, eight o'clock in the evening one as, as, a, as a latest operating times. Many of those businesses up, up, up there do operate till about six, seven o'clock at night, sometimes when they're working overtime. Um, I know the paint shop does. Um, probably, I should declare, I, I did used to use the paint shop, but not under the current ownership. Um, so I know they do work um, uh, extended hours some evenings up to about seven or eight o'clock. So um, this is on, on, in, on, in, on an industrial area, although with the I'll be with a different use to what it currently has as a car park. Uh, therefore, Chair, I'd like to move the recommendation with the slight amendment that the operating hours are 0700 to 20, 20 hundred hours, 8 a.m. to 8, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. That's quite clear. Can I just say, I was expecting quite a long debate on this because we've got all these conditions that have been mentioned. Hmm? Sorry? Chair, if it's been um, put forwards, the debate can continue afterwards, but we've had something put forward, so it has to go on. Who would like to second that? Um, Chair, I'm happy to second, but I would like to suggest another condition be added if Councillor Levitt is happy with it, obviously. Are we able, can I check with um, planning, to put a condition limiting the size of vehicles that have access to the site to three and a half tonnes and below? The problem with that is it's voted for us to monitor that. And if we can't monitor it, then it's un an un unreasonable condition to impose. Um, because obviously when the, no one's there 24, you know, the, the, during the operating hours to actually see what vehicles go in and out of it. Um, so I... I I think that, in my view, that would not be a particularly reasonable condition to impose on, on the decision. In that case, um, don't worry about that condition because it can't be legally imposed. And I would be happy to second Councillor Levitz and look forward to hearing any other people that want to talk. Thank you. Any other contributions? Councillor Tyson? I need to say that I also support the application with the um, times as indicated, and that presumably just involves an amendment to the condition of three that's in the um, report. Um, so, yeah, and uh, also with taking note about the um, condition on lighting as well. Um, which may not be such an issue if the operating hours are shortened in the evenings as well. Thank you, Chair. Would it be possible to limit the height of vehicles able to access? That way it would then be limiting to the three and a half tonne vehicles and not the HGVs. We were sort of muttering about, I apologise for that. Um, I was asking Harris if there, if there was a condition regarding fencing around the site, which obviously then we could consider this such a such a barrier around the frontage. Um, Harris explained the fencing details already on the plans, um, so there's not a condition covering that. Um, I guess we could possibly add a condition subject to the agreement of the applicant requiring fencing, um, if that's if members are minded to go that way. And then maybe the details of such a barrier could then be submitted for consideration to see what it would look like and where it could go on the site. And if that's something that maybe um, the applicant is willing to do, then officers could you know, ne negotiate that under the provisions of a condition if members are minded to go that route. Response? Quite happy to have that as a condition if it's worded in a way that um, I, I can, yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to say understand, but I, I can then repeat in a more clear manner. <laughs> I look at the applicants. Would you be willing to accept an additional condition regarding yeah. details of fencing yeah. to be suited? Not really at all. I mean, personally, I don't want large vehicles. We are looking. 
we are aiming at, at sort of people who want to do house stores and and bicycle collections and you know uh, perhaps a car you know an old car might uh, they do fit in uh, so i think a height restriction would be the obvious uh, we could have more generic conditions saying details of fencing to be submitted and agreed prior to occupation of the of the and, and to be installed on site prior to occupation of the development commencement of use first use we can obviously tidy up the words in slightly okay council levitt Happy to accept that condition as part of the proposal. Um, just bearing in mind, of course, that sticking a height barrier on might actually make it more intrusive than not having one there, make it more obvious in the landscape. Uh, but that, that as, as the condition's fairly generic anyway, fine. Any other contributions? So we have the proposal by Councillor Levitt, seconded by Councillor Daniel Allen with the amendment and conditions, which we all understand and remember. Yes. Are you happy to go to the vote? Thank you, Chair. That motion is carried. Anne. Thank you. Thank you. Um, members, please just note on page 175 of the agenda, there's been three new appeals submitted in the last period of monitoring, and we've had two decisions. Um, both have been dismissed. Thank you. Any questions? No. Nope. Uh, what for noting? That's the rest, that's it, isn't it? Yes. Okay, well, thank you very much. I call this meeting closed at 21.33.